Welcome back everybody. This video that you're watching right now is going to be episode one of this new thing that I'm going to try called Lens Days. I've done a lot with lenses in these videos before and I kind of wanted to formalize that a little bit because I think it could be really interesting. And so the idea is that on Lens Days, we will talk about some time specific aspects of lens design. We're going to actually review lenses. We're going to talk about techniques. I really want to get into optics. I think there's room for some really cool things that we can discuss. And this first episode today is sponsored by the awesome folks over at Wine Country Camera. Wine Country Camera produces the best filter holder system available. In fact, it is the only filter holder system with a workflow for combining a circular polarizer, ND filters, and graduated filters, and making adjustments without ever disturbing critical focus. Their Blackstone filters use vapor deposition coating techniques and fire polished shot ultra white glass that are designed for high resolution detail without the color shift that you find in many neutral density filters. This system uses step-up rings to attach to any lens, and for wider angle lenses with no filter threading, they have a 150 millimeter system with custom designed lens attachments. This is the system for serious landscape artists. Right now, you can use the link in the description to save 20% off of anything in the entire store by using offer code AOP on checkout. Once again, that offer code is AOP, and I want to give a special shout out and thank you to Wine Country Camera for sponsoring another episode of The Art of Photography. I want to start out this series by doing doing a video to establish a bit of a baseline as we get into this so we can kind of get our feet wet and start talking about aspects of lenses. Now, when you get into lens design, it gets into physics and math really quick. And these are two things that a lot of photographers, myself included, tend to start glazing over. So a lot of times you'll hear photographers say things about a specific lens like this lens sucks or this lens is awesome or this lens is amazing. Well, last time I checked, suck, awesome, and amazing were subjective terms, not factual terms. Two things come to mind. First of all, there is no such thing as the perfect lens. Now, certainly optics designers strive for perfection in what they do, but lens design is like pretty much everything else in photography. In order to gain in one area, you're generally going to have to sacrifice something or give up in another. It's a constant series of push and pull, just kind of like anything else out there. I think lens designers strive with the best they can do, but then you also have constraints like price, weight, autofocus. There's a number of things that go into that. And it brings me to my second point is that lenses are tools. You might have two lenses of the same focal length. One is really good at certain things, but not so much in other areas. And another lens might pick up where that lens left off. And this has little to do with price or expense. It's just the design of a lens and how it's set up to work. So for example, if you were to go on B&H's website or Adorama or Amazon or any of them right now, and you said, hey, list all of the 35 millimeter lenses that are available for, let's say, Canon EF mount, you're going to have a ton of search results that come back. And not only do Canon make several variations on that same focal length, but you have third-party manufacturers as well. And they're different lenses that are designed to hit different things. And some of these restrictions can be price points. Some of them can be things like maximum aperture, weight, what's the size of the lens, how fast is the lens, how fast is the autofocus. And so all of these are basically restrictions that go into lens design. And so that's why you're going to see, obviously, so many different lenses for one focal length that make up this variety. So we're a long way from perfection. And I want to reiterate that lenses are tools and picking the right tool for the right job. I'll give you an example. I'm not a big fan of pancake lenses. There's something about making the optics in such a tiny form factor that enough corners get cut to where I just don't like personally the optical quality. However, I know many photographers who I look up to and respect that love pancake lenses because they allow them to be more mobile. They're better for street photography. They allow them to be in the moment. And so what's right for them is probably not right for me and vice versa. If you were to give them a larger lens, which I find optically superior, it might somehow how encumber their ability to get street photography the way that they're used to shooting in a very natural way. So again, there's different price points, there's different form factors, different sizes, and this is kind of what I want to make sense out of in this series. So let's look at this from another perspective. You might have some lenses that are affordable and some lenses that are really expensive, and how much better are really expensive lenses? One of my favorite examples of this are the Zeiss Otis lenses. Now the Otis is a series of lenses that essentially had a design approach that was unique in that Zeiss went to its optics team and said, hey, look, no restrictions whatsoever. You can make as big a lens as you want, as expensive lens as you want. Like, what can we come up with with no restrictions? And these are lenses that are available in two DSLR mounts. You can get them in Nikon F or Canon EF. You can also use adapters and mount those onto mirrorless as well. The lenses are massive. They have wide apertures. They have no autofocus. They have beautiful optic quality. And it's really interesting because they're also outrageously expensive. And so, 
are those lenses like, you know, the ability to shoot wide open with no chromatic aberration and really even sharpness across the entire image frame, they're really something to be said for, but is it worth $5,000 just to be able to have a lens that wide open renders so beautifully? And that's kind of where a lot of people are going to question this. They're not lenses for everyone. They are way out of my price range. I do not own any of them. I have rented them before and I've used them in testing scenarios. And I can say that they are beautiful lenses, but they're also not perfect for every situation that you might be in. If you're doing something that's more improvised where you need to have very accurate and fast autofocus, those are not your lenses. They're manual focus. That's a lot of turning and a lot of tweaking and a lot of setting up. Up. But if you are in a situation where they work, the optic quality on them is gorgeous. I had a similar situation years and years ago when I was a big Canon user. I was mainly using a Canon 5D Mark II and then later a Mark III. One of my favorite lenses in the Canon EF lineup is the 85mm f1.2. Now there's a version 2 of that lens and it's one of my favorites. It was also astronomically expensive for me at that time. It's not Zeiss Otis level expensive, but it's, you know, it's under 2000 but, you know, not much. And so for me at that time, I was looking around and I decided that I would rent that lens when I need it. But the one that I wanted to own is actually this one, which I just pulled out. This is the Canon EF 85 millimeter F1.8. Now the difference between F1.8 and 1.2 is a little more than a stop. But last I checked, you can get this lens for like $270 or something like that. This is one tenth of the price of, let's say, one of the new RF mount 85 millimeter lenses. So what's the difference? I mean, we're talking about just a little more than a stop of light. And this is fascinating to me because that one stop or so of aperture difference ends up driving 80 to 90% of the price increase. Now, to us as end users, it's how much are you going to notice in that one stop? Now, to be honest, there is more than just one stop of light that you're going to gain or a shallower depth of field. Generally speaking, when you have a wider aperture lens, it allows the optics design to be such that it's going to be sharper, especially when you start stopping down. So for instance, if you have two lenses in the same focal length, let's say one is a 1.4, the other is an f1.8, the 1.4, when you stop it down to 1.8, most of the time will be sharper. It will have better resolution because it's just got more to work with and it's also got the benefit of being able to add a little bit of aperture into the mix. But I do think it's fair to consider price when it comes to lens design because to most of us these are big investments. And while we definitely have manufacturing techniques that allow us to have much better lenses at much cheaper prices than we did in the 80s, that still is a concern that goes into these. And it also is going to come down to your own perception. I mean, can you see the difference in sharpness between this $200.85 or the $2,000.85? And that's going to be different for everybody. Another example comes to mind, which is Nikon and the Z system. So we have the Z6, the Z7, and the Z50, and they've been putting out lenses for this new mount. This is not easy to do. You're looking at an entire range of lenses for a brand new mount. Now, Nikon have gotten a lot of criticism because a lot of these are f4 zooms and 1.8 prime lenses. People are saying, where's the f1.4s? Where's the 1.2s? Where's the 2.8 zooms? And I actually would argue that this was the move Nikon needed to make. I have used most of the lenses in that lineup, and I can tell you from firsthand experience that they're not bad lenses. There's several that are really incredible. I think the 85mm 1.8 is really good. I think the 50mm f1.8 is really good. And sure, it would be great to have a 1.4, especially when you consider like the F-mount DSLR lenses, you know, some of the classics in that lineup, like the 85 1.4 or the 105 1.4. They're incredible. And I think myself included, a lot of us would like to see those available in the Z series. We just don't yet. But I actually argue, though, that price is a factor. And I think Nikon have done this the right way. I think if you come out with expensive lenses that people can't afford, it's going to be harder to sell them on a new system. Whereas if you start with the 1.8s, the F4s, so on and so forth, at least you have a baseline and you have some affordable options for people. Which brings me to a question that I've got for you. And that is, how well do you know the lenses and the system that you're currently shooting on? How well do you know how the optics perform? So for instance, if you have a zoom lens, do you know what the sharpest part of that zoom lens range is going to be? Do you know what it does at the extremes, like the shortest focal length or the longest focal length? Do you know what the corner sharpness looks like? Do you know at what aperture the lens is getting its peak performance? Do you know when contrast starts to be affected? Do you know when diffraction sets in when you have it stopped down too far and you're actually losing sharpness? Now, a lot of you may be glazing over at this point and saying, what does this have to do with the art of photography? I think it has an enormous amount to do with what your expectations on. It's understanding the tools that you have and learning how to use them. 
I have a perfect example for this. Let's let's move over here for a second. So this is one of my absolute favorite lenses to use for this type of demonstration. This is a Zeiss Loxia 35 millimeter f.2. And the reason I wanna use this lens in context of what we're talking about is that this is a lens that depending on where your f-stop is set, depending on your focus distance from your subject, it has a lot of different characteristics. And I actually would argue that this, even though it's a prime lens, has an enormous amount of versatility to it depending on your taste and depending on what kind of aesthetics you like. Now, what I do want to say about this is a manual focus lens, and this is a Zeiss Biagon design, which is an older design. It's not a modern designed lens. And so I think that's actually one of the really interesting things about this and this whole Loxia series that Zeiss did, or based on older Zeiss designs, and there probably aren't very many lens companies that have of enough history to draw on to actually do that. But I want to use this as an example because it can be a little finicky and it can do some weird stuff, and this is why you need to understand how your lens performs at various apertures. So let's look at some sample images. And this one I literally shot just a few minutes ago outside. The sun was going down, and this is shot wide open at f2. You can see in the corners, the bokeh areas of this have a very strange look to it. And that has a lot to do with the fact that it's an older lens design. Uh, it's not a modern lens by any stretch. And it has kind of almost a pictorialist look to it, the way that the highlights kind of start to bloom out of things. And it really becomes kind of messy. And that may be something that you like and you're striving for. It may be something that you don't care for. But that is wide open. And then when I stop this down to about 5.6, you can see that it cleans it up. So this is an example of a lens that's characteristics really do change depending on what your aperture setting is. So this is at 5.6. The other cool thing about this lens is I can continue to stop it down. And one thing about most lenses is by the time you get to f11, you're going to start seeing some diffraction. And I really wouldn't ever recommend stopping a lens down to f22. This one does sharpen up really nicely at f11, f16. And there is some diffraction that you see at f22, but I don't think it's that big of a deal really. Anyway, this is a really versatile lens because of that. Now, there are some characteristics on this lens that dictate situations I would not want to use it in. And let me give you an example of that. This lens does render a really nice bokeh effect, but if you're going for the big circular bubbles, you're not going to like it because you're actually going to see blemishes in one of the elements in this lens. It looks like there's a bubble that you see in every circle, and there's also some rings, so you can tell some of these elements are not polished out, probably, compared to their modern counterparts. But Again, it's as if the look you're going for, this is probably not the lens for that job. This lens is also a manual focus lens, which could be a deal breaker for some. I actually like using this for street photography. And to do that without autofocus, you do need to do what's called zone focusing, which is kind of an old school technique. But they do give you markings on the side of this lens for not only a focus scale, but also a depth of field scale with your aperture collar. So what you want to do is kind of pre-visualize what it is you're going to be shooting in a street context. And you want to focus into that zone, Make sure you have enough depth of field to work with, f5.6, f8, somewhere in there, and you can get some really good images with this. And because this lens is pretty much designed when you stop down to get really sharp detail, this is one of my favorite lenses for both landscape photography and then also architecture, things of that nature. And I've got a couple examples in here that I'm really happy with. Again, it's a little slower process. You're going to be using manual focus, but if you understand how to use this lens, you can get some incredible results out of it. And I'd also argue that if you don't spend the time to really get an understanding of the equipment that you're using, some of these things are going to surprise you and disappoint you down the road. And so I think that's just a really important thing to understand. Now, you don't have to have fancy, expensive, complicated gear to do this. I'd even argue that some of my favorite photos that I've made were taken on things like a pinhole camera. It's just I embrace those imperfections. I worked for a long time just using Holgas and Dianas and any kind of toy camera that just had a single element plastic meniscus lens. And it's the imperfections and the aberrations and the fact that it's ugly that actually makes it beautiful to me, and it gives me a very different look. There's a lot to be said for not having everything perfect all the time. Anyway, some thoughts on lenses, and I actually think that this little 35mm Loxia would be interesting just to do a whole video on someday, because it's got a really interesting history behind it, and I really love the way that Zeiss approached that entire Loxia lineup, being kind of these classic designs brought into the modern age with full-frame mirrorless. So anyway, I would love to hear from you what you guys think. Leave me a comment. I'll catch you in the next episode. Until then, later.